the professionalization of soccer for the first time and the pushback against that from the elite. Um, so Louie and I are both, um, both avid soccer players and, and fans. So with um, all the world soccer leagues being shut down, we both thought this would be a, a good way to get our soccer fix in. Yep, oh, definitely. <laughs> nice. Oh, it sounds, sounds like an interesting one. Well, thank you both for being here. And um, thank you to all the participants who have signed on today. This is our third episode of the Clements Bookworm. I'm Angela Unk, Director of Development at the Clements Library and your host for today. Um, this meeting is being recorded to share online later. And this afternoon, you will receive an e email with the broadcast um, as well as some of the resources mentioned during today's talk. Just want to give you a quick tutorial. Uh, so far, we've been doing a nice job with uh, chiming in on chat. So hope hopefully you found that. I, I would like to sit, whoops, sorry. I would like to suggest that you select all panelists and attendees so that we can keep the conversation going with everybody. And you'll notice that the conversation goes by quickly. So because of that, if you have some specific questions to ask, I ask that you do that in the Q and A section. You can upvote other people's questions and the answers are then posted in with the question. Okay, so um, this program is brought to you by the Clements Library. Uh, we're on the campus of the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. And the Clements Library enables the discovery, learning, and teaching of American history through the collection, conservation, digitization, and availability of primary sources on paper. Today, we have two panelists talking about minorities in US military history, and uh, we'll be getting to them in just a couple minutes. But before that, I just want to tell you a quick story. As I was thinking about um, what we do at the Clements and also uh, how we tell the stories of American history, um, I started to think about how important the interaction is and the, the discussion and the ideas. And that's how we really discover and get to know these stories best. So here we have two uh, pictures from our November pop-up exhibit for Veterans Day. We did a pop-up exhibit where we got out materials from the Clements Library about uh, showcasing soldiers' experiences from early exploration and the Revolutionary War through World War II. And it was a really wonderful day to hear people respond to and discuss these different materials and maybe put them into context of their own experiences. And in fact, in this picture, you see two World War II veterans who came to see that exhibit, Bill Lewis and Tony Procassini. Pro Pro and um, Bill Lewis, his uh, paintings are at the Clements Library that he made while he was um, in service. And you see a picture of him looking at these different materials with his son, Clayton Lewis, our graphics curator. And so I just want us to think about how important those conversations are and to know that that's one of the things we really strive to do at the Clements Library is bring people together to look at these materials and to really think about the stories that are contained within them. So today we have Louis Miller who is a reading room supervisor at the Clements Library. And Louis is talking about torchbearers of democracy. Um, so 
Louis, I know that you uh, have been interested in World War I for a long time, so maybe you can just tell us a little bit about how you got interested in World War I. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, is I, can everybody hear me okay? Am I coming through? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, well, my, my interest in World War I really was spurred by a freshman uh, year course I took at Kalamazoo College. It was on the uh, sort of memory of the war um, in the 1920s and 1930s. And um, that, that experience in that class um, was, just, was just amazing. And it sort of, uh, you know, led me to eventually, even though I went into medieval history for a little while, um, writing my senior thesis at Kalamazoo on sort of the American memory of the war, and in particular looking at the local community of Kalamazoo and how they commemorated um, uh, the local fallen soldiers. Um, this senior thesis actually I uh, heavily edited and did some more research on and it was just published last year in the Michigan Historical Review. So if any of you are interested, that should be available online. Um, and yeah, the, basically ever since I came to the Clements, I knew I wanted to do something on World War I. Um, I had to familiarize myself with the, that part of the collection. And um, you know, luckily for me, uh, for the 100th anniversary, of the centennial. We did a physical exhibit at the Clements Library with a pamphlet uh, published alongside of it. And um, yeah, it was basically my dream project to work on. And uh, um, you know, I continue to research on World War I and I'm currently uh, researching a project on the American Red Cross and the, the role of, um, of them facilitating sort of the, the memory and commemoration of fallen soldiers. Um, so that's what I'm currently working on. But yes, totally obsessed with the First World War. Thank you, Louis. Um, I've learned so much about World War I from talking with you and uh, seeing that exhibit. Um, and I look forward to hearing more about this book today. Can you please tell us more? Yeah, yeah. So like, um, like you mentioned, Angela, the book I'm, I'm talking about is uh, Torchbearers of Democracy. It's uh, a book by Chad L. Williams, who's a professor of history at Brandeis University. Um, this was published in 2010, so about a decade ago. Um, and this book focuses on the experiences of the African American community, um, in particular, Black service members in and after the First World War. Um, I read this book in preparation for the exhibit I curated at the Clements Library to commemorate the centennial. And I was very convinced by Williams' sort of overarching argument in this book that the ways in which Black soldiers were treated in the armed forces and in particular their experience in France, ensured that these men returned home not willing to accept the pre-war status quo that white Americans so desperately tried to reinforce. These soldiers were subjected to racism at every turn while serving their country, supposedly fighting to make the world safe for democracy when they were being denied their democratic rights at home. The book is divided into two sections, war and peace. Um, so, you know, not surprisingly, the first half really focuses on the experiences in France and in training of these soldiers, while the second half looks at the, the post-war period and how these soldiers returned and sort of um, changed the ways that African-American communities were resisting white violence. I'd like to take a few uh, incidents described in the book to illustrate the type of treatment that African-Americans faced during this conflict. The 93rd Division was the only division of the American Expeditionary Forces, that is the troops that went overseas. Um, the, the 93rd Division was the only division that spent the entirety of their combat service under French command. And this division included the 369th Harlem Hellfighters Infantry Regiment, which is a very famous and well-known uh, regiment. The 93rd Division served more days on the front line than any other American unit during the war. They, along with the 92nd Division, were the only two black combat divisions in France. White Southern politicians in particular had tried to ensure that no black troops served in combat roles. And with the exception of the 92nd and 93rd Division, basically all African-American service members served in labor capacities, including the unloading of supplies, but also the task of dealing with the retrieval and burial of dead American soldiers. And while about half of the white American soldiers in France were classified as combat troops, 
only a fifth of black troops were. On August 7th, 1918, the French officers of the 93rd Division received a confidential memo titled, On the Subject of Black American Troops. This was at the bequest of senior military officials in the American Army. The memo attempted to discourage the friendly relationships that had developed between the African American soldiers and their white French officers. It also warned that, quote, Black American troops in France have, by themselves, given rise to as many complaints for attempted rape as all the rest of the army. This statement in the memo was not backed up with any factual evidence and is totally preposterous and untrue. White Americans were terrified by reports of sexual relationships between black men and French women, and the army was determined to put a stop to it lest soldiers returned home thinking that they could do the same thing in the United States. Linking black soldiers to an inability to control their carnal urges played into the white American strategy. The vices of African Americans were a, quote, constant menace to the American who has to repress them sternly. And notice that in this memo, American is just taken for granted to meaning white. The reason the 92nd and 93rd divisions were some of the first combat troops sent home after the war was basically because they wanted the troops home, not around white French women, not getting these sort of um, um, ideas of what they could do when they returned home. And I've barely scratched the surface of this disgusting treatment black soldiers were subjected to during this war. Um, and while I haven't touched upon it here, the violence African-American servicemen and the rest of their communities were subjected to after the war ended is truly horrific. You might know some of the examples such as the Chicago race riot or the Tulsa race riot, uh, but I encourage you to read this book and educate yourself more on lesser known incidents such as the Okoe massacre in Florida in 1920, in which over 50 African American members of a town of about a thousand people were killed in one day simply because a few of the members of their community had attempted to vote. As I said earlier, I could go on and on about this book and the histories it tells. Um, I personally think this book should be required reading for any American in this country. And I hope that you'll all take the time to see the facts for yourself and grapple with uh, what it truly means to be American. Thank you, Louie. Um, that, that is really, um, you know, it's so good that that we have records that we can look at and really think about what all of this, um, you know, looked like during during the war. So, one of the things that I know people might be interested in is what kinds of materials uh, related to World War One do we have, and um, maybe you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, sure. So, you know, um, even though the Clements Library um, is known mostly for its uh, 18th and 19th century collections, um, since the time of Randolph Adams, the first director of the library, um, we have been collecting uh, materials pertinent to the World Wars, um, and especially with the late Dwayne Norman Diedrich, um, who also had a, a vested interest in Douglas MacArthur um, and collected materials related to MacArthur, in particular, MacArthur's time in um, as a senior officer in the 42nd Division during the First World War. Um, so even though we're not known necessarily for having these 20th century military collections, we, we actually have a, um, a couple hundred at least. Um, I, uh, I think what's interesting about what we have is like what, what we don't have. Basically, that's, that's the more interesting part. Um, uh, and I think, Angela, we had been talking about this earlier. But there's you know only um, two different collections that we have that capture the experiences of black soldiers during this conflict. And one of those we acquired in the last year. Um, the other one really only uh, captures uh, training in the United States. That soldier was never sent overseas. Um, you know, these materials are very rare. Um, if any of you have any connections or know of any materials like this, we're always um, interested um, in gathering the experiences of soldiers, but in particular, um, African-American soldiers in a conflict like this. Um, 
I'd recommend you look at the pamphlet that Anne just shared the link to because uh, at the back of this pamphlet is sort of a list of various collections that we have um, at the Clements Library. And um, also, um, I think, you know, you'll be getting my contact information. So if any of you have any questions about materials we have, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Great. Thank you so much, Louie. Um, I've been keeping track. I don't see any questions right now. So uh, thank you so much for, for this great presentation. Um, real quick, everybody, let's see. Um, all right, I'll unmute Jacob and introduce uh, Jacob Dopp, who is a graphics division cataloger at the Clements Library. And uh, Jacob, um, maybe you could tell us a little bit about uh, why you chose this book. Yeah, certainly, Angela, thank you. Um, so I chose The Earth is Weeping, the epic story of the Indian Wars for the American West by Peter Cousins today because this is a book that I ended up reading last year um, when I was in the course of working on cataloging a collection, the Richard Port Jr. Collection of Native American Photography, um, which is an extensive collection of historic, uh, mainly 19th century photographs um, related to Native Americans. Um, and I just wanted to get um, a better background on um, the history of the Indian Wars for the West, um, because a lot of the figures that are photographed in this collection were played prominent roles in various conflicts um, during the Indian Wars. Um, so I thought it would be good to get uh, a better understanding of these, these conflicts and this period of our nation's history. Um, and The Earth is Weeping is an absolutely fantastic, comprehensive overview of the Indian Wars for the West. Um, primarily focusing on the wars um, that picked up immediately after the Civil War um, in, in Lakota country, um, this is Red Clouds War from 1866 to 1868, um, and going through up until Wounded Knee um, and the tragic events that unfolded there, and everything in between the Apache Wars, the Yavapai Wars, Sand Creek Massacre, um, the Battle of the Washita, the Modoc War, um, and, Northern California, Southern Oregon, um, the Red River War in Texas, Oklahoma, um, Nez Pierce War, and tons of other um, major and, and lesser known conflicts as well. Um, it's a very exhaustive, comprehensive look um, and really with a, a military history bent to it. Um, this book actually received the Guggenheim Lehrman Prize for the best military history publication in 2016. And it was nominated for the Pulitzer Prize um, in military history, a nonfiction um, that year as well. Um, like I said, it's a very balanced view of these conflicts. Um, the author, Peter Cousins, um, whom he was a former uh, US Foreign Service officer. Um, and after he retired from the Foreign Service, he became an author and historian. Um, but he, try to put forward as balanced a view, taking into account sources, both official government sources um, on the American side, um, military documents, correspondence between officers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and also balancing that with um, interviews, you know, of Native American actors, um, warriors that, um, that took a part in a lot of these conflicts. And, he tried to um, be as balanced as possible in the sources he was utilizing and coming to the conclusions that he draws. Um, and he, he mentions in terms of the, the progression in how these conflicts have been treated over the years. Because, um, you know, first everything is obviously treating um, the American soldiers involved and the generals involved as nothing but heroes. Um, you know, totally glorifying everything they did, maybe sweeping the unsavory bits under the rug. And then in the 1970s, um, you start getting the pendulum swings in the opposite direction. You have things like um, Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee and Dances with Wolves, um, 
and these counter narratives that um, really emphasize the Native American point of view, um, first and foremost. Um, and he tries to toe the line between those two views and try to be as comprehensive and balanced um, in portraying these events as he possibly can. And I think he does a fantastic job. Um, and one of the things that really struck me most about this book, um, which again, touches on you know, power dynamics, rivalries among military officers, as well as indigenous leaders. Um, there's a lot of parallels between the both, um, both of the sides. Treaties, um, 19th century American military life, tactics, strategy, um, federal policy um, of particularly the Ulysses uh, Grant administration and the peace policy um, that ended up failing abysmally. Um, the role of the press in framing the narratives of what was happening um, during the Indian Wars and the dichotomy between the, the largely sympathetic Eastern publications versus the Western publications that are um, basically advocating for extermination. Um, he details extensive Indian Bureau corruption and rivalry with military um, officials and the, the power struggle between those two institutions. Um, but really what struck me the most and what he does a really good job of elaborating on um, is the importance, the integral importance of Indian scouts to the US Army um, during literally every single conflict of the Indian Wars. Um, I think he goes as far to say as there is not a single conflict during this period of history where the involvement of Indian scouts serving the US Army was not integral to the outcome being in favor of the United States. Um, and you know, one might one might ask, you know, why why were why were Indians scouting for the United States of America? Um, you know, the enemy. This is the invader. Why are they helping the white man who is infiltrating their lands? Um, and the answer is multifaceted, but what Peter Cousins does a good job of illuminating is the U.S. is very cognizant of these pre-existing factions and divides and rivalries between various Native American tribes and even within them. You have pro-peace pro and pro-war factions within a given tribe. Um, and it, you know, in particular, um, tribes like the Crow and the Pawnee um, on the Great Plains, um, these are very small tribes relative to some of their neighbors. And for, for centuries, they were, they were outnumbered and being hemmed in and being harassed and, and killed um, by Lakota, Cheyenne, Arapaho raiders. And once the United States enters the fold, um, you know, tribes like the Crow and the Pawnee, they see this as an opportunity to side with a stronger nation who can help protect their interests. And so it, it makes sense to join sides um, with these people. Um, there's not, you know, you can, you can see parallels to um, earlier incidents um, which is Pontiac's War, um, where there's very few uh, visionary Native American leaders who really saw the writing on the wall in terms of, no, the actual enemy, the actual greater threat to all of us is this expansion of the United States. Um, if we only put aside our differences and join together, we might stand a chance. Um, and yeah, so actually, um, the recruitment of Indian scouts wasn't officially permissible until 1866 after the Civil War. Um, I might add that the landscape of the United States military after the Civil War was in dire straits. Um, a lot of budget cuts had to be made. Um, a lot of tough calls had to be made because funds needed to be freed up um, to help rebuild the South and engage in reconstruction. And so the military, for better or for worse, um, fell on some pretty hard times. Um, the volunteer army that was raised during the Civil War, um, a lot, you know, once the war ended, a lot of these people went home, mustered out of the army. Um, and there was a dearth of qualified soldiers um, to fill the ranks. Um, and needs to say that the types that ended up filling the ranks were not the most savory of characters often. Um, pretty body types, um, just looking for a bit of fun on the frontier. Um, not maybe recognizing the seriousness of, of this kind of combat. Um, and so actually, Peter Cousins even goes so far as to say that 
um, a lot of these Indian scouts um, were not just integral because of their scouting ability, their ability to track um, Indian um, settlements, and they can actually track you know, horse tracks on the ground where no one else can see these tracks. They can see poles being dragged along the ground, um, teepee poles. Um, they can t estimate the size of a camp. Um, they can actually tell how many women are in a given party. Um, they can look at um, the urine patterns um, for the different horse tracks. I guess uh, mares and stallions have different urine patterns and a lot of times women were placed on top of mares. So if there was X number of mares in a certain group, that would mean there's this many women traveling. You know, they can do all sorts of absolutely insane things that the average person would not have any inkling how to do. And it was integral um, to being able to make sure um, that these um, war efforts um, were actually successful. Um, and also they were, they were better fighters than a lot of these soldiers. Um, they grew up in cultures that really placed a heavy emphasis on, um, you know, a big part of becoming a man was becoming a warrior, becoming skilled in fighting. Um, so, uh, Jacob, I know that um, one of the reasons you read it is you were trying to identify some of the Indian scouts in the fort collection, and um, I just love hearing more about those specific stories. If you don't mind, maybe I'll share the screen and um, you can talk a little bit about that. Sure, absolutely. So, um, so all these images that we're about to be showing, they're all part of the Richard Port Jr. collection of Native American photography. Um, this view um, that you see before you is a stereograph of an Apache scout named Nantage. Um, there's a verso inscription on the back of this photograph um, that indicates that this photo was once in the hands of a man by the name of C.E. Harlow, who was an Indian trader at Fort Apache um, for a considerable time in the 1870s and 1880s. And he is indicating on the verso of this photograph that Nantage um, actually helped guide him from Camp Apache to Tucson, which is 260 miles. Um, through fairly hostile territory, um, he, he safely guided him. And unfortunately, um, Nantoche was apparently killed upon his return. He was stabbed to death while he was asleep. Um, and Nantoche's background is interesting. He is one of the few um, Indian scouts who actually received a Medal of Honor um, for their, his actions um, during the Yavapai Wars. Um, and it was during a specific incident um, in December of 1872, the Battle of Salt River Canyon, otherwise known as the infamous Battle of Skeleton Cave. Um, apparently Nantage um, was a part of, I think, 20 to 30 Apache scouts um, who were there at the time. And he gathered up a group of sharpshooters and they went um, to this cave stronghold that a group of Yavapai were hiding out in. And they, the, the chief of the Yavapai who had led his people to this cave was totally convinced that no one would be able to trace him to the stronghold. No one ever had, no one ever would, no need to post sentries. So they were totally caught off guards and completely trapped. And Nantage and a group of sharpshooters um, stood at the, the top of the cave. And then Nantage actually saw that a young boy suddenly was in the midst of the crossfire. And so he put down his rifle and ran out and grabbed the boy and brought him to safety. Um, and that's um, apparently what led to his Medal of Honor citation um, for his bravery um, in the heat of battle. I think that's a remarkable story. That is a remarkable story. Um, and then we have these two photos as well. Yeah, so both of these photos um, are of Crow scouts who participated um, in General Custer's campaign that ended with the Battle of Little Bighorn and Custer's unfortunate massacre. Um, the gentleman at left is Curly, um, who is billed in this photograph as General Custer Scout and the only survivor of that horrible massacre of 1876. Um, 
Curley was part of Custer's contingent of scouts. Um, he was not with Custer when um, Custer was cut off from the main body of troops um, and his men were killed. Curley was not there. He was at a different point. He was at a vantage point that he, he could see everything unfolding, but he was not physically there. Um, this is according to accounts that Curley gave immediately after the incident. Um, later on, um, I think um, some newspaper reporters kind of uh, maybe modified the story a bit <laughs> over time. And it, it, you know, it wasn't quite as sexy of a story to have this guy who wasn't actually with Custer um, when he fell. Um, so they, they made it seem like Curley was actually almost like standing next to Custer um, at the moment of his death. Uh, which, which doesn't seem to be true, but Curley did seem to have reveled in the celebrity that this afforded him um, later in life, and he subsequently started modifying his involvement on the day, um, which is pretty fascinating in its own right. The gentleman on the right is White Swan. Um, this is another one of Custer's scouts. Um, he was not with um, Custer's detachment, he was with Major Marcus Reno's detachment, who was sent at the very beginning of the battle um, to try to scare away um, the Cheyenne and Sioux pony herds um, that were held nearby their main camp, which everyone had grossly underestimated the size of Sidney Bull's um, forces that he was able to gather on that day. Um, it's possible that there were upwards of 1,800 to 2,000 individual Indian warriors on the day. It's a substantial force, um, far more than the American forces realized. Um, and White Swan's story is quite interesting because um, during Major Reno's initial assault, um, they were pushed back almost instantly. And um, another famous uh, scout, um, a half Eric or a half Sioux scout, Bloody Knife, was standing right next to, to Marcus Reno um, when Bloody Knife was shot in the head. And basically from this moment on, Reno completely lost it. He instantly went for his whiskey flask and started downing his whiskey and became a completely ineffectual commander. He ordered a haphazard retreat up, up the hills um, where his, his, all of his troops were basically stuck for the next um, considerable amount of time. White Swan um, did not run, did not flee. He instead um, bravely sought out combat with a number of Cheyenne and Sioux warriors. Um, by all accounts, he fought with tremendous tenacity and he received two grievous wounds. Um, I don't know if you can see very well, but that arm, his right arm hanging down at his side, he's intentionally obscuring his right hand um, his wrist, his hand was left palsied um, as a result of one of the injuries sustained um, during this fight. And also he walked with a pronounced limp. He injured one of his feet as well. I believe he got a huge gash across his forehead as well. Um, White Swan um, was prepared to die um, until another scout realized the situation he was in, went out, grabbed him, pulled him back to safety and saved his life. But yeah, White Swan holds the distinction of being, I believe, the only Indian scout to have been wounded um, in combat on that day and Thank to have survived. You, Jacob. Thank you. Um, we have a couple of questions. So we have one question um, about whether or not the Native American scouts were paid in some way. Great question, yes, they were paid. Um, actually, I was looking at this the other day. Um, so there's a distinction between, you could have enlisted scouts who were officially enlisted um, almost as auxiliary forces in the army and they were paid by the army. Um, and then you also have um, scouts that were hired on commission and they were paid a little bit differently. Um, there were some scouts that even um, wound up on government pensions and they would get paid um, even after they were essentially retired out of active duty. Um, and they would receive government pensions for the rest of their life. And even after they died, their spouses would continue to receive a government pension. So they were compensated financially. 
And then we have another question about whether or not uh, the book takes a perspective that looks across national borders, uh, particularly in the case of the Comanche, conflict with Mexico was just as significant as conflict with the United States. This multinational dimension tends to be told pretty well in a lot of recent histories of conflict in the 18th century U.S. Northeast, but seems to be left out of Western histories. Yeah, great question. Um, from what I recall, um, they do touch a bit on, once they start, um, once Peter doesn't start focusing on the tribes of the South, he does touch on a bit of the background, including um, the extensive scope of Comancheria, um, the Comanche Empire. Um, I think he, tend, he focuses a bit more on the Apache landscape, um, just because of the significance of the Apache Wars and the longevity of those conflicts um, and their importance, but in, in national memory, um, it's kind of, I think, has a bit more weight. Um, but yes, he does focus a lot on the incursions that the U.S. Army had to take hunting down Geronimo, the incursions we made into the Sierra Madre Mountains in northern Mexico and the potential political ramifications that that almost kicked off. Um, the Mexican government was not best pleased having American soldiers running around in their, in their lands, um, you could imagine. Um, I think he also touches on the, the tensions in the North as well. Um, after, after Custer's uh, defeat at Little Bighorn um, was kind of a Pyrrhic victory for Sitting Bull um, basically every conflict after that um, was, was a loss for the Sioux and um, Sidney Bull and his followers decided to go to Canada. They crossed the border into Canada so they could be safe from um, retaliation from the American forces. And in 1877, the Nez Pierce um, conflict kicked off and the Nez Pierce eventually um, made their way, which by the way, it's one of the most remarkable mil military conflicts in, in world history, not just American history, in world history, um, what the Nez Pierce were able to accomplish um, when they were able to fend off a full army with very, very meager resources um, and traveled from their traditional lands in Idaho into Montana. And then they decided, they tried to go to their, their allies, the Crow, who could offer them no help because the Crow did not want to disturb their relationship with the United States, um, which was integral to their own survival. Um, so then the Nez Pierce turned their attention to Sitting Bull's band in Canada. They tried to join him in Canada. Um, and of course, the Canadian government was watching all of this with, with eager eyes. Um, they wanted a resolution to this pronto, preferably one that was outside of their borders. Um, and so there was a lot of tension between the United States government and the Canadian government with, with how to best handle this. Thank you. Um, I'm going to unmute Louie as well because we're getting questions for both of you. And I know we're running a little bit long, so we'll just try to answer a couple more questions and then uh, wind, wind down here. So, um, Louis, I see a question about how common was the actual interaction between Black American troops and French women? Um, you know, I don't have like specific statistics of, of how, um, how often that happened, but uh, you'd, you'd have to think that actually very often, um, because if you think about it, you know, uh, there's, I think, 8 million French men of fighting age or something like that. And basically 4 million of them are either killed or wounded in the war. You know, these are kind of rough numbers, but to give you a sense, most of the young men, middle-aged men are gone from these communities. Um, when soldiers are billeted in these towns, they're definitely interacting with the locals. And actually, if you read, uh, you know, the Williams's book, you'll see that there's some interesting examples of, um, though it's through the eyes of the African-American experience, because the French are still very racist, um, but they just don't have the same ingrained racism as Americans. Uh, but it's, it's, it's interesting. Um, they uh, often tell stories about how the French actually liked the black soldiers more than the white soldiers. So it's very, very interesting. But, um, you know, yes, there, there were, and there were a couple incidents of, um, of uh, 
charges of rape against black soldiers um, uh, raping French white women. Though, of course, um, like I said earlier, the, there were basically unsubstantiated rumors of black soldiers raping the entire time they were in France. Um, and uh, W.B. Du Bois really tried to set out after the war to combat this totally made up portrayal of, of this. I mean, you know, yes, some black soldiers raped, um, so did every soldier in that conflict. Uh, you know, it's not like you can racialize that component of it. Um, so, you know, read the book and you'll see tons of examples of interactions. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's fairly common. Okay, thank you. Um, Jacob, we have a couple of questions about the photographs themselves. Uh, uh, some comments about how those photographs were staged with unrealistic garb and surroundings. And I know the accuracy of the photographs is something that, that, that you've definitely uh, considered as you've been cataloging. So is the photo of White Swan considered accurate to his appearance? Do we know anything about um, what, what he's holding or how he's portrayed? leave that photograph um i believe that can be considered authentic dress um that that feather headdress um is something that you see quite often amongst the the tribes of the great plains um i don't see anything that's inconsistent with um the kind of ceremonial traditional clothing um that you would see amongst uh, the tribes of the great plains um and same with uh, that uh, portrait of Curly as well. Um, you see that that hairstyle he's wearing, um, that kind of kofru with the, uh, it's almost like it's slicked back. Um, this hairstyle was uh, very popular amongst um, the Shoshone and the Nez Perce um, in particular, and these tribes of uh, um, the Plateau region. Um, and it, it filtered over to the Crow um, eventually, um, because they had close ties to the Shosh Shoshone and Nez Pierce. Um, and so um, that I would also consider everything that he's wearing in that photo um, to be authentic. Um, and yeah, this is one of the, the great, uh, uh, the greatest challenges uh, I encountered um, when trying to catalog this uh, port collection of Native American photography. Um, there are plenty of photographs where you can you can tell that um, yeah this is this is not what a person of this tribe would be wearing, um, and yeah it's it's very very difficult um, to navigate sometimes. Um, you know you have to take everything with a grain of salt um, when it comes to a lot of these Native American photographs, both in terms of you know does what they're wearing accurately reflect what. Um, people of that tribe would be wearing at the time. Also, people are mis misidentified constantly, both in terms of um, themselves personally, um, they're, they're given a wrong name or the wrong translation of a name, um, or they're given the name of their father instead of themselves. Um, and also people's tribes have been misidentified in certain photos as well. Um, so it really, I just, I had to make sure to really spend a lot of time on each and every photograph, really making sure that no stone was unturned, um, make sure I have all the details as accurately described as I possibly can. Um, very challenging, but it, it's very, very interesting and rewarding um, when, when you figure out something right. Right, exactly. So thank you so much, Jacob, for doing that and for telling us about this. Um, we, I see we have some questions about the port collection itself. So we will send everyone an email after this with additional resources and we will include in there our uh, press releases about the collection so you can read more about it. So thank you so much, Louie and Jacob, and thank you everybody who's uh, signed on today. We went a little bit long, but these discussions are always so interesting. It's hard to stop. Um, next week, we're going to try something a little bit different. We will be uh, having a conversation with an author, Meg, Megan Kate Nelson, the author of Three Cornered War. 
Uh, so our director, Paul Erickson, will be in conversation with her about this book. And then we have some wonderful uh, uh, topics uh, that, that have come up as people have volunteered to be panelists. And we have one to two panelists in each of these topics that you see on the screen and would love to hear from um, other people who might be interested in participating in talking about these topics in the coming weeks. So you can email me at angmo at umich.edu. And of course, we're always happy to hear any feedback that you have as well. So we'll continue the panelists and I and the staff of the Clements to be online for a few more minutes to answer your questions. And so you're welcome to continue to ask those and to chat with us. In addition, we, um, I launched another poll because I'm curious how many people have seen some of the materials that we've put out there related to um, the, the, our recent exhibits and pamphlets. So please take that poll as well before you sign off today. And thank you so much for joining us. I wish I had seen Paul's question earlier. <laughs> oh, sorry. I was going to read that one and I just. Oh, no, that's okay. That's okay. It's just, it's a really, it is a really interesting topic. Yes. Oh, uh, sure, Barbara, I can answer that question now. Um, so Paul Erickson, our director, was asking, um, did the experience of fighting in the war overseas increase any support among African Americans for African nationalist movements that were also on the rise in the post-war period? He's thinking specifically of Marcus Garvey, but interested in others as well. Um, uh, the second half of the book really does look at a lot of um, people like Marcus Garvey um, and and uh, sort of the 
internal conflict within the African American community um, for more established uh, sort of um, advocates for the race, such as Du Bois, versus um, sort of new and more inflammatory uh, figures such as Garvey. Um, both of them seized onto the service of, of, um, of black soldiers as furthering their cause. Um, du Bois had attempted to, uh, he had a Pan-African uh, Congress done um, in Paris in 1919, at the same time as the uh, treaty negotiations for Versailles are going on, um, with, with a Senegalese, um, I'm going to slaughter his last name, Diagne, Diagne, um, but they, it's, it's interesting because it sort of showed the limits of Pan-Africanism, you know, they were, they were culturally, they had a lot of similar goals, but they, they just couldn't agree on enough issues to really um, lead to anything out of that, unlike the sort of later 1950s, 1960s Pan-African movements that really got independence for these African um, colonies. Um, the second half of this book does a, a, a fantastic job of sort of showing how the sort of new Negro movement, which was being pushed after the war, you know, we're not going to let ourselves be pushed around again. We're not going to just let ourselves be lynched, not be allowed to vote, um, be treated like, you know, um, third class citizens. Um, and either like veterans themselves were helping to resist some of that and lead it, or the leaders were very cognizant of how much the black community had um, been just taken over by with admiration and um, and just pr uh, pride for all of these black soldiers that went overseas. I mean, you know, these black American troops had come back having killed white Europeans. You know, what, what does that say about um you know the sort of eugenics and racial theory at the time? Um, it's it's just it's just really it's really interesting and and um, and uh, I, I won't go into detail, but the second half of the book also looks at sort of the the battle over um, who's going to write the official history of the black participation in the war. Um, and Du Bois had a, a project in mind. Um, he never completed it, which is a bummer because the other two books I'm thinking of um, uh, are, are interesting sources, but really, um, you know, they're, they're being done to appease the sort of uh, the white establishment, and so they definitely aren't um, honest about the actual awful treatment that these soldiers, uh, you know, went through. But um, yeah, I would highly recommend um, Barbara if if you're interested in more, um, get you know, check out that book or get that book and and read at least the second half. But I would recommend reading the entire thing. It's just it's it's eye opening. Thanks, Louie. Yep. So Angela, how are we? Um, how are we sharing these recordings again? I'm sorry, I didn't. Uh, I didn't hear all that information. Oh, we have um, it set up on the website, and uh, and then later today we will send an email to everybody who participated as well. So okay. um, so you can share the link to the website or. Uh, wait until you get the email message from us and forward it on to your friends. So thanks for asking that question too, Barbara. Gabe, I'm just seeing your uh, your comment now. Um, yes, I totally remember meeting you and your son. That's uh, that's that's awesome. That's awesome. I'm glad to hear that he's going to be able to continue his uh, his interest into World War One.
Doug, believe me, I'm also suffering and I have a, a book from interlibrary loan out right now that I'm just hoping they, uh, they won't come after me for because, you know, it's at the Clements Library and um, uh, sorry, I, I can't get to it. <laughs> it's going to be late by, <laughs> at this point, I'm guessing six months. All right, well, thanks everybody. I think we're about done. <laughs>